welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Well, good evening to you. I am truly humbled when uh, a man of the stature of Jim Cobra says things like that about me. I mean, I am standing here, we have a saying back home, gobsmacked. You don't know what that means. It just means, you know, you had a loss for words when somebody that I so respect and honor, it's, this is the highlight of my visit to the U.S., just seeing pastors Jim and Debbie and the team again. And I, can I ask you just to honor them and give them a great hand, because... Bless you. Bless you. Well, it's, it really is so marvelous being with you here again at The Rock. Um, as I was standing there, you know, um, it just feels so good to be here. We have a saying back home, and we probably got it from you guys, that blood is thicker than water. You got that here? Yeah, you see, we did get it from you. <laughs> Blood is thicker than water. It means your family is closer to you than anybody else, right? But you know, it's moments like these that I am so aware that spirit is thicker than blood. You can enter into an environment and immediately there's a connection at a level where you just feel this is good, this is home, these, these are my people. And uh, so it's just marvelous being with you and being able to share with you tonight. And as Pastor Jim has mentioned, there are some um, DVDs that you can pick up. I especially had these made so that we could uh, bring them here to the U.S. while I was communicating on certain things. And it's called The Completeness in Christ three sessions of 45 minutes each to help people to understand that we have been included in the greatest moment in the history of mankind. You see, when history recorded the death of one man, eternity recorded the repositioning of humanity. Because we were included in a reference. You know, I, I really have to encourage, I, I don't know, are there any Lakers supporters in the house? All right. Well, my heart breaks for you. We're hanging in there, all right? We're hanging in there. It's not, not all over yet, okay? But it's amazing, you know. I don't know if you've, if you've seen this. Lakers supporters are a very unique species. It's amazing, it's amazing when the Lakers win, suddenly they have an attitude. <laughs> have you seen that? When the Lakers win, I mean, they don't walk, they move. <laughs> Why? Because, you see, there is a victory that has been recorded, and if you ask them who won, they would answer you, we did. We did. What do you mean we did, man? You did nothing. <laughs> Say, hey, what do you mean? When the Lakers won, I won. You see, their victory affects my life. Their victory affects the way I feel. Their victory affects the way I think. Their victory affects the way I engage life. I want to tell you today, the Lakers unfortunately have to play over and over again to establish that victory. But we are here to celebrate a victory that has once and for all been recorded, never to be challenged again. And we are included in that reference. His victory is my victory. His triumph is my triumph. 
It's the reference of my life. You see, as I discover how I have been included in that reference, it affects me. It affects how I think. It affects how I talk. It affects how I engage people. It affects my life. It changes the way I live. So if you want to engage in a deeper understanding of this reference, pick up one of these after the service. But tonight I want, to, I, I want to talk about this victory and how it finds opportunity in our lives to affect our world. You have the privilege of being part of one of the greatest churches on the planet. You really have. But I want to talk to you tonight about how you can be part of this dream and part of this church's mission to effectively touch and change and transform your world. You know, in... In Africa, we have a saying, you probably know it here, it takes a village to raise a child. And literally what that means is, is that your village, your world, your environment that you grow up in affects how you think, how you believe, what you value. It affects who you Oh, it takes a village to raise a child. Your environment has a distinct effect on who you are. Now listen, if it's true that it takes a village to raise a child, the question I pose to you tonight is, who takes responsibility to raise the village? Who determines what our village will look like? Because you see, if the church does not take responsibility to impact our village, to impact our environment, to impact business and education and arts and the media and every one of the spheres of society, if we're not going to affect our village, some unbelieving person will. Many years ago, as we started out in our church and we were privileged to have Pastor Jim and Pastor Debbie to come visit us. Luke was also with them uh, years ago. And um, we started out and they, it was obvious that God had grace upon us as a ministry. Our church was growing, it was flourishing, and we were happy about the church. And one day I had a deep experience with God where I sensed God challenge me and say, go and release the people to become effective within this community so that they will not only be a church for the church, but a church for the community. Well, I didn't really understand and know how to do that, so I asked God to speak to me and give me strategy and, and us as a, as, a, as a leadership to deeply understand how we will be more effective to be able to do that. Well, God took us on a journey, and in that journey, God started speaking to us some strategy about how to effectively impact our world. One of the portions of Scripture that God really used to speak to us was the portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 6, which is the story about the feeding of the 5,000. Well, it's a beautiful story, but we see how the disciples identify that these people have been there all day, 
They've been in the sun and now they are hungry and immediately the disciples have concern for these people. And they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, we are concerned. The people are now hungry. It's late in the day. Let's send the people away. You see, the disciples had concern, but the Bible says Jesus had compassion. And God showed us in that portion of Scripture that there was a distinct difference between just having concern and having compassion. You see, concern sees the problem. Concern sees the challenge. Concern is aware of all the things that are wrong and broken and challenging. And many times, people, we as Christians or as the church, we are just concerned and concern makes that we know about all the negative things and know about all the brokenness and all the sinfulness but we don't get involved but God wants us to transition from concern to compassion so that we will say Lord even if we don't feel we have the resources we want to get involved we want to get involved It's interesting, Jesus says to the disciples, guys, we're going to feed them. Now, they knew they did not have the resources to to affect this massive challenge. And you know, many times we feel that way. We feel so overwhelmed with everything that is wrong and negative, and we just feel we don't have the resources to be able to make a difference. But Jesus was about to teach them a lesson. And he says to them, go break up this group into groups of fifties and hundreds. Well, here the disciples go. They were not trained in crowd control, but they had to go and break up this group into fifties and hundreds, smaller groups. I often wonder why Jesus did that, but I think it was because he wanted to make sure that everybody was fed so that he could monitor whether everybody was going to have something to eat. And then after they had done that, Jesus calls the disciples And the Bible says he takes the bread and the fish, a few loaves and a few fish, and he blesses it. And then Jesus does something very interesting. Jesus doesn't go and break the bread and the fish and build a whole pile of fish and bread here behind him so that the disciples can look at the resource and look at the need and say, well, resource meets need. We're okay. We're in good shape. What does he do? He breaks the bread and the fish and he puts it into the hands of the disciples. And he says to the disciples, guys, go feed the people. I mean, can you just imagine, just for a moment, just think about that. You're a disciple. You realize you've just created a, an anticipation here. You've got to go feed these people now. But Jesus said we must do it, so here we go. I see how that disciple goes to a group of 100 and then decides it's rather start with a group of 50. Huh? Man, I, I can see that disciple when he breaks off the first piece. I guarantee you it was a small piece. <laughs> Why? Because he's a smart disciple. <laughs> this stuff's got to last. I see him breaking off a small piece. Can you imagine that first guy that gets the first piece? (laughs) Just sense the tension in this reference. Here he is, he's got the... uh, Another piece. 
And he breaks off another piece. And as he's breaking the pieces, he suddenly becomes aware. But there's something miraculous happening in my hand. And he's not quite sure about this, but he's wondering about it, so he, he wants to test it, so he's, he breaks off a bit of a bigger piece. And he sees this is kind of working, and a bigger piece. And I just see the boldness taking hold of that disciple, saying, hey guys, wh why don't you just help yourselves, man? There's... There's a lot of stuff here, man. You guys just help yourself. Start dishing out. Why? I know they started giving people more than they needed because the Bible says they picked up 12 baskets after everybody had had enough. You know, here's the thing. Many times we say to ourselves, what difference can I make? What, 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 what can I influence? You know, how can I make a difference? I've only got this little bit. I've only got this little reference. You know, I can't change this. Look at the problem. Look how big it is. Listen to me tonight. God wants to challenge you. Just start breaking the pieces. Just start. Just with what you have. Start trusting God that he will use you, that, that his grace will be upon your life, and that, that you will see as you start that he multiplies it in your hand. But move from concern to compassion. You know, I, I grew up with kind of an understanding that I... I don't really want to engage the world because I, I knew that the Bible says we are not of this world. So I didn't really want to engage the world. I, I tried to see how far away I could get from the world. But it was in this journey where God started speaking and saying, but I have an issue with the world. It's my world. I want to touch this world. I want to love this world. I want to bless this world. I want to engage this world. And, and, and so God started speaking to us. And one of the scriptures God really used to help us move from, from concern to compassion to really engage the world is John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and we're going to read from verse 15 to 18. Now, this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. This is where Jesus is praying just before he was to leave this world. And when he prays, he says, Father, I'm not just praying for my disciples, but I'm praying for everybody that is far off that will believe in their word. In essence, Jesus was including us in that prayer. And now he prays in John 17, verse 15, the following. He says, I do not pray that you take them out of this world, but that you will keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, that portion of Scripture I knew. But, you see, I did not realize that this text is within a particular context. And the context is, is don't take them out of this world. They're not of this world, but don't take them out of the world. And then he says something very interesting. He says, sanctify them in your truth your word is truth as you have sent me into the world, so I also have sent them into the world. Now, you know, I, I didn't quite understand the scripture. And I was grappling with it until one day I got a revelation 
when I was trying to set my dog free from fleas. So I share with you tonight the parable of the fleas. <laughs> my dog had fleas and I was thinking that if I could comb through the hair of the dog, every flea that I could find, if I could catch it, I could deliver my dog from fleas. Don't know if you've ever tried that, but it's a very difficult exercise. But I was busy doing this when a friend of mine arrived and asked me what I was doing. I explained to him my project. He said to me, Alan, but why don't you just go and buy a flea collar? I thought, well, there's an idea I never thought about, a flea collar. Let me go to the store. So I go to the store and I buy a flea collar and I put it around the neck of the dog. And within three days, all the fleas are gone. I'm intrigued. I can't believe what's happened. And I'm wondering, how does this system work? Because how do the fleas at the tail end know it's now time to get off the dog because there is a flea collar around the neck of the... How did they know it was a flea collar? I never told them that it was a flea collar. <laughs> Somehow they just understood it. <laughs> so I went back to my friend. I said, you better explain this to me. He said, Alan, it's actually pretty simple. He says, in this flea collar, there is a powder, and when the dog moves, the hair brushes against the collar, the powder is released, it sits on the skin of the dog, it's assimilated through the skin, gets into the bloodstream of the dog, it builds an immunity in the bloodstream, and now the blood circulates in this dog, and now when the flea at the tail end bites the dog, the flea dies and the dog lives, and I said, hallelujah, I now understand John 17. This is what Jesus was praying, right? Jesus prayed, listen to this, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the flea nest of this world. Put them right in between the fleas. New translation, right? But listen, but do something to them. Do something to them that will so impact their lives that will so affect them, that will build an immunity within them, that will build a capacity within them, so that when they enter into this broken, sinful world, they will not be affected by the world, but they will affect their world. That's what we believe. That's why we believe in truth. Because truth has the capacity to so affect your life, to so impact your life, to so position your life, that when you enter into this world, you're not entering it as a person that is so afraid and anxious and uncertain. You're entering into this world as someone that knows, I died with Christ. I was raised with Christ. I'm seated with Christ. Christ in heavenly places. That's why, that's why you need to get stuff like this, to get it into your system so that truth can find opportunity in your life. That's why you come here every week. That's why you come on Sundays. That's why you're consistently in church. Why? Because you want to have truth come into your system. And once you have truth, once truth finds opportunity in your life, brings an immunity. You know, where I come from, South Africa, we are very aware of, of AIDS. It's a, a terrible disease. It affects people in their immune systems. That's what AIDS stands for. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It means every negative thing, every bacteria, every virus that is in the vicinity is going to find opportunity in your body because you don't have resistance. You cannot resist it. You don't have immunity. You know, as bad as physical AIDS is, I think there's something worse 
It's spiritual AIDS. It's living without the capacity to resist that which is wrong and evil and broken and warped and confused in this world. That's what truth does. Truth builds a strength within you so that you do not submit to a broken, confused reference out there. That's what it does. Build strength. And this is what God's intention is for our lives. Why? You see, because if you are strengthened with truth, you now leave here, not just as a Christian that has been blessed, but you leave here as a Christian that is sent to go and affect your world. You see, many people come to church for the program. Listen to me tonight. You're not just coming to church for the program. You are the program. You are the program. You see, tomorrow, if you're a teacher and you're going to that classroom, you're not just going there because you, you love education and you can endure kids and you need a salary. But you're going there as a commissioned one as a sent one, as one that has the calling of God upon your life, as a kingdom agent who now enters into that classroom and that becomes the place where you are sent as the ambassador of God. You are the Adam of God and that's your garden and you're now going to God and tend it because you represent the kingdom of God in that space. So listen... Tomorrow, the, the program of the church doesn't stop. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, the program of the church is alive all over the Inland Empire. You still call it that, don't you? <laughs> well, make it California if you do want to. Just, just go and, and be the saint one. Go and be the representative of God. Within that environment. You see, you did not receive truth just so that you can have a good time in the fellowship of believers. We come together to engage with God and engage with His Word and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us as Pastor Jim has just prayed so that we can be empowered to go and make a difference. As a matter of fact, what you are doing at your job tomorrow is the church's program. What you're going to do tomorrow is part and parcel of the dream and the vision of this church. But you see, many times, we, we are like, the people of Israel who were living in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was an, an awesome city for people who loved God because it was the city of God. It was Jeru Shalom. Shalom meaning completeness, wholeness, health, Safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity. Everything good was wrapped up in this concept of shalom. And this is the city of shalom. It's the city where God is. It's the city where the presence of God is. It's the city that they so loved. But you see, right through the Bible, there was another city that was the antitype of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, from Genesis... To Revelation, 450 times, Babylon is the antitype of Jerusalem. Babylon was everything that Jerusalem was not. And people that were in Jerusalem 
they kind of sneered at Babylon because Babylon represented everything that was wrong. As a matter of fact, a good Jew, if he wanted to insult you, he would send you to Babylon. Man, go to Babylon. And then the unthinkable thing happened. The Babylonians came, and they came and they conquered Jerusalem. And they broke down Jerusalem's walls and the temple, and they took the people of Jerusalem as exiles all the way to Babylon. And here they were sitting at Babylon, there at the river, and the Babylonians come to them and say, hey guys, we hear you guys sing such nice songs. Don't you want to sing us a song? And they say, by the rivers of Babylon, how will we sing a song in a strange land? So we can't sing songs here. I don't have song in my heart when I'm in Babylon. I need to go to Jerusalem. And they don't want to be here. They can't experience the favor and the blessing of God here in this context. So what happens? We see how God starts speaking with them while they are in Babylon. And in Jeremiah 29, God speaks prophetically to them. And many of us quote Verse 11, very often, I know which thoughts I'm thinking of you, says the Lord. Thoughts that will bring you peace, shalom, over your life, and I have a future for you. But in verse 7, just listen to what God says to them in verse 7. He says the following. Remember now they're sitting here in Babylon. He says, and seek the shalom, the peace, of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Isn't that incredible? Listen to what they say. Listen, seek the peace of the city to which I have brought you captive. Lord, do you want to tell me you're in this? Some of you are sitting here and saying, Lord, do you actually want to tell me that you're in this, that I'm at this job where I am, where all these ungodly people are and nobody wants to worship God and there's no song of joy for the Lord in this place and they're looking at me and, and I don't want to sing in this place. I actually want to say a few other things to them in this place. The Lord says, seek the peace. Seek the peace. Seek the shalom of God because the shalom that you are experiencing here in Jerusalem, God wants you to be an agent of when you go to Babylon. Go and bless them. Go and serve them. Go and just release the grace of God upon them. I believe God wants to give us keys to the environments where we're functioning. I truly believe that. You will remember Jesus says to the disciples after they have fed the 5,000, Jesus says to them, go over to the other side. They really didn't want to go to the other side because the other side was not the Israel side. The other side was the heathen side. It was where the seven nations of Canaan had settled. They didn't want to go to that side. But Jesus said, go over to the other side. But it's not the first time that he said to them, go over to the other side. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus says to them, let's go over to the other side. Now, they didn't want to go there because they were superstitious about going to the other side. It was the unclean side. It was the pig-eating side. It was the, it was the bad side. Was, they went to that side as a good Jew. When they came back, they had to go through a whole cleansing ceremony. So they really didn't want to go there. They, they believed that you were looking for trouble if you went to that side. But Jesus said, we're going over to the other side. So they get in the boat, and now they're rowing over to the other side. And you know the story, the wind comes up and the storm comes up. And they're anxious about the storm, not just because it's 
a, a storm is because they're superstitious. They believe they're doing the wrong thing. They shouldn't be doing this. As a matter of fact, when they wake up Jesus, because Jesus went down and slept, when they wake up Jesus, it's the only place in the Bible where the disciples accuse Jesus, and they say to him, do you not care that we perish? Well, what does Jesus do? He stands up, quietens the storm. They can't believe it. And they get over to the other side. Well, when they get over to the other side, there's really nobody interested in them. Nobody really wants to uh, engage them because the Jews and the Gentiles didn't, didn't mix. They didn't spend time together. They didn't engage one another. So there's nobody there except one madman full of demons. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, that's our guy. <laughs> you know, I just see those disciples. Oh, man. But they get hold of this guy and they drive out the demons and you know what happened. The demons went into the pigs and the pigs had a mass suicide and then it ruins the economy and the people of that region come and they chase Jesus and his disciples away. Well, the guy that has just been delivered, he says, I want to go with it. But Jesus says, no, you stay here. Man, Jesus was smart. I always used to feel so sorry for this guy. But Jesus was so smart. You know why? Jesus knew through this one man, he had just found the key to this whole region. <laughs> through one man, the key to a whole region. I believe we're about to see God give us keys to unlock environments that have previously been locked to us. I really believe that. Well, here the disciples go back. They're just pleased. They're going back to Israel's side. And while they're at the Israel side, man, things are really happening. It's looking up. Jesus is doing miracles. And then they feed the 5,000. I mean, the fish oil is still in their hands. And Jesus turns to them and says, Go over to the other side. And you know what he said? I'm not going with. You guys go so long, I'll join you later. And now they get in the boat. They're very uncertain. This time, if we have trouble, he's not in the boat. <laughs> It's midnight, it's dark. And then Jesus does this incredible thing. Remember now, they're superstitious, they're anxious. They got this omen about being, going to the other side. Now, Jesus comes walking on the water. <laughs> Come on now. He comes walking on the water, and I mean, in their anxiety, they look at him, they say, it's a ghost. Jesus says, no ghost, it's me. And the Bible says, and he wanted to pass them. Why? Because Jesus wanted them to get used to go to the other side on their own. You see, many times we go to the other side through the projects of the church, through the activities that a church is doing, and that's wonderful and it's marvelous and, and, and it's great because the people are there with you journeying. But listen to me, the season is coming where God wants you to enter the other side in the knowledge He will not leave you or forsake you. He is with you, but you have to go and make a difference. Go and affect your world. Well, what happens is, when they arrive on the other side, the most amazing thing happens. These are the people that chased Jesus away not long ago. The Bible says 4,000 people gathered. Why? Because this one man had done what Jesus had told him. Go and tell your story in every town and village. And suddenly they heard, that man is back here again. And they gathered together and Jesus starts praying for them, healing them, ministering to them. And the most incredible things happen. And then what happens is we see they get hungry again and the disciples have to feed them. So the disciples feed them and then what do they do? They pick up seven baskets. Now they get back on the boat. They're going back again. 
Jesus makes a statement. He says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. The disciples try to figure out what Jesus was saying, and then they can't figure it out. And then they say, you know, maybe we forgot the bread, but Jesus says, guys, you don't understand. Come here. Let, let me quickly ask you a question. Now listen to this. Jesus says to them the following. He says, when we were on that side, the Israel side, there were the 12 tribes of Israel. How many baskets did we pick up? They say 12. He says, you're right. He says, and when we were on this side, here where the seven nations had, had located, how many baskets did we pick up? They say, seven. He says, you're right. He says, and don't you understand? And they didn't. And neither did I. <laughs> Until one day, we saw what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying. He says, listen, this was more than just feeding people, hungry people. This was a profound prophetic reference that I am the bread of life yes, and there's enough when I feed the 12 tribes of Israel there's enough there's enough in that environment where you are comfortable and where you feel that this is a great place to be and this is where we'd like to be. There's enough for you to have here. But listen, when we go over to the other side, there's also enough to feed the seven nations that need to be fed. Listen, this is what Jesus was saying. This side or that side, it's both my side. It's all mine. I'm Lord of all. It all belongs to me. It's mine. And listen to this. Tonight, I want to release you as an agent of grace saying, Lord, I go over into the other side. When I go to the job tomorrow, when I'm engaging with people, when I'm just engaging with people that don't know anything about God, it's the other side. Lord, give me the keys so that we can engage those environments and affect them for the kingdom of God. Would you just, for a moment, just reach out to the Lord? I just want to bless you, Lord. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church, but you're Lord of the cosmos. And tonight, Lord, there are people here that love you, that want to serve you, that want to journey with you but also want to be used by you. And I know, Lord, how desperately people sometimes want to do something, but, Lord, tonight we just pray that there will be an empowerment of the Holy Spirit empowering people that as they leave here, they would leave in the sense that God is with them. That in a smile, in a handshake, in a, in a hug, in a, in, a, in a serving of people, Lord, people would just become aware that these people have something different. May grace be upon their lives. May you give them wisdom, Lord. May you give them opportunities to affect their worlds. We bless this whole region in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You might have walked into this place tonight. And you've heard this message and you, you so desire to be part of this incredible experience of being a child of God and being used of God. But maybe as you sit here tonight, you know that you're far from God. Tonight, you don't have to walk out of this place without knowing that you know that you know that God has cleansed you from everything that would bring guilt and shame into your life, that He will reposition you, and that you could know that you are a child of the living God. And I don't want to leave you tonight just listening to this message, but not knowing that you are truly a child of God. If you walked into this place tonight, and you want me to pray for you, I'm going to ask you, would you stand 
and say, tonight, I choose to follow Jesus Christ. I want to make him Lord of my life. I don't want to go out of this place unless Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Would you please stand if that's you tonight? It's your opportunity to be a follower of Christ. We've all, at some moment in our life, had to make this decision. Don't want to embarrass you, but I want to challenge you. It's a choice you make, a public choice for Jesus Christ. And every person in this place that has made that choice and knows that it's worth making that choice, would you say amen? Amen. That's the encouragement you have tonight of people that have made that choice. I want to invite you for a last time. Is there anybody in this house that says, it's me? Please pray for me. Would you quickly stand? I'd like to pray for you. I'm just going to pray. Thank you. Is there anybody else? An incredible, brave person. Bless you. Bless you, my brother. Anybody else? Thank you. Two at the back there. God bless you. You're making the right decision. You're choosing to go the right path. This is the greatest day of your life. This is marvelous. I now want to ask you, would you just, that are standing, would you just get your stuff, come down to the front here. We're going to pray for you and bless you. And would you encourage them as they walk down here? Would you just encourage them? Just come down here. Just come down here. Lord, I give you my heart. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you. Let's just stretch our hands out to these people as we bless them here tonight. Father, we know the heavens are rejoicing. We know that that angels are rejoicing tonight because people are coming home. And tonight we just bless these people. Thank you, Lord, that they have just made a public decision. What a moment. What an incredible moment in their lives. We speak life over you. We ask, Lord, that they would sense the grace of God just enveloping their lives tonight and repositioning them as kingdom agents. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' marvelous, marvelous name. Amen, 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 amen. Now you listen to me quickly here up front. There are some really good people that just want to lay hands on you and just pray for you further and just give you something in your hand that will help you on this journey. That good man over there is going to tell you where to go. Just follow him that way, would you? Let's just honor God. Bless the Lord.